Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Farmer, and I am the author of Dash. I'm here at Plotly headquarters in beautiful, snowy, freezing Montreal. Uh, and, and today, I'm going to show everyone here um, our latest, our latest open source Dash project, which is Dash Table. Um, so I'll start. I start sharing my screen. Um, Feel free to ask questions uh, as I'm presenting, and uh, and I'll try to answer them. We got about half hour, so uh, we'll go through things pretty quickly. But um, uh, looking forward to sharing this with everyone. So all of the examples that I'm going to be going over today is, are available on our on our online documentation, and that's at dash.plot.ly. So everything that I'm running today, you can find on our documentation. In particular, when you visit this documentation, if you scroll down, you'll see the section called component libraries. And inside component libraries, we have core components and HTML components. And what we're going over today is, is this latest component we released last month, which is the data table. If you click in here, this is going to load a whole new user guide for the Dash data table. So there's about eight different chapters, and we're going to run through a few examples from each chapter today. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm particularly excited about. But this is, this is the source of truth for everything about the table. We're, we're updating this documentation really frequently, uh, a few times a week. So um, if you have any questions, first check out this, this documentation. Um, and then uh, and see if you can find your answer there. Hey everyone, can you see me again? Okay, great, sorry about that. All right, let's give this another try. Everyone cross your fingers. Okay, great. So um, just quickly go over some of the capabilities of Dash and we can, we can Look at these examples, and, um, and as we're as we're looking at them, think about how we might incorporate interactive tables. So um, this is a kind of classic example of, of of a Dash application. We've got some graphs on the left, and we've got a set of controls on the right. These controls are directly connected to our Python functions. So as I update different parameters inside these controls my custom analytic Python code is running. It's running some models. And then um, that code is updating what we're seeing in the front end. Um, in this case, it's running some machine learning code. And then it's updating these graphs on the left here. So these controls here, there, there's many of them. Like there's, there's several different parameters. And, and all of these parameters are inputs to the model that we're running. So think of that as we're looking at the table because um, tables and spreadsheets are actually a really great way, really great sort of um, uh, easy to use, compact way to embed many different parameters, especially parameters that um, might have an arbitrary length. So in this case, there's sample size is just a single parameter, but if we were running many data sets, we might have several different sample sizes and that type of control um, would be really that type of parameter would be really well suited for embedding inside um, inside an editable table component instead of using a set of 
um, a set of uh, controls like this, like sliders. Um, so, you know, the, the key things to remember with Dash as we're looking through this is that is that everything in the user interface that we make, where this whole user interface was written entirely in Python. Um, so even though it's in the web browser, we didn't have to write any HTML or any JavaScript. Dash handled all of this. And as we update different controls, the parameters of these controls are getting passed into our Python functions that we assign to Dash. And then the way that the app updates, in this case, the way that these graphs update um, happens also through, through the Python functions that we're writing. So this is a, a typical kind of um, uh, very uh, intensive uh, modeling application written in Dash graphs, many different parameters embedded as controls. We can also create dashboard-like applications with Dash, or we can even create things like um, eight and a half by 11 printable, very um, more conventional type um, reports. So lots of different types of applications that we can create with Dash. We're creating these entirely in Python. And Dash provides a set of building blocks for you to assemble, assemble these applications, whether they're graphs or text or sliders or drop downs. And now our latest one is tables. So again, all the examples I'm going to go through are, are taken directly from the documentation. That's at dash.plot.oy slash data table. Um, so you can follow along there. So we're going to just dig into code for the remainder remaining 20 minutes. Let's take a look at just a really simple example of how you get a table on a screen. So in this example, I'm reading data from a CSV file using this um, data manipulation library, pandas, loading this into a data frame. And then this is the syntax for the dash data table. I specify the columns, so the names of the columns up here. And then I pass in my data frame into uh, this data property of the table. So df.toDict is going to format our data into a list of dictionaries. So it's going to look something like state is California. You know, number of solar plants is 289. Like this dictionary here would represent the first row. Um, and then there'd be many of these dictionaries to represent each row. So if you have data that's not in a data frame, you can just specify it as a list of dictionaries and pass it directly in. If you're using data frames, you'll just have to do this little conversion. And that's going to make this table. Um, so there's some light interactivity by default. I can hover over these rows, and there's a little bit of highlighting. Um, and and this, is, this is sort of the hello world example. But one of the really powerful things about this table is that the data of this table is, can itself be an input to your dash callbacks. And the data itself is also editable. So this is a super simple example where we have a table component and we have a graph component. And we're just connecting these two using our own Python function. So this table has some data about, say, different models of cars and different attributes like the torque or the weight or the width or the efficiency. And I can edit this table. And as I'm editing these cells, this the entire data set that's in this table is getting passed back to my Python function. And with that data, I can do anything that I want. Like I could pass that data into um, some modeling code, some custom analytic code. I could filter that data. I could run some machine learning models off of it. In this case, I'm doing something pretty simple. I'm just reformatting the data into a graph component. And then I'm just displaying it here. So this graph component in particular is the parallel coordinates chart component. And it's got some really nice features for um, displaying highly dimensional um, data sets. So each one of these axes here represents one of the parameters. Each axis has its own range. So you can have different columns that have a really wide um, and very varying ranges, like torque here is in the hundreds, whereas width here is 0 to 3. And, and I can rearrange these different uh, these different um, axes. So parallel coordinates is just this awesome tool for, 
for analyzing highly dimensional data sets and comparing, in this case, many different models of cars and their parameters. Um, but if we look at the if we look at the code here, this whole app is really simple. Like I wrote this entire thing in 50 lines. The first part of the app is the layout, and this describes what it looks like. So we've got a table component, and then I'm just filling it in with some mock data right now. By default, the table isn't editable. So if I want to make it editable, I pass in true to this editable equals true flag. And then I'm placing a little container for the graph below. Now, this application becomes interactive through this callback here. So what this callback is doing is it's saying, I'm going to update the graph below this particular chart. And I'm going to update this graph when, whenever the data or the columns of the data change. So as I'm editing different values in this cell, it's actually you know, it's changing the data property of this table. And so this callback is saying, whenever the data changes, pass in this new data into this function. And then this function here is going to update the graph component. But inside this function, I can do anything that I want. In this case, I'm not really manipulating the data in any way. I'm just converting it into a data frame, and then I'm constructing a declarative representation of a parallel coordinates figure. So I'm just passing the data into this graph component, and then I'm displaying it. But this is kind of where the magic happens with Dash, where inside this function, you could do anything that you want. Like you could use that data and you could write it to a SQL database, or you could use that data as parameters for a machine learning model. Um, you could use that data and write it to a CSV file. Um, you, could, you could do financial portfolio optimization on it and then update several other graphs. Instead of just updating a single graph, you could update several graphs or you can display some text that shows a summary statistic of the computation that you're running. The important thing to note is just that this data here that's in the table, all of it gets passed back into your callbacks. So you can do whatever you want with it. And it's really easy to edit. Um, as an end user, this, this type of spreadsheet interface is really familiar. So one thing that we could do is um, we can kind of treat our, our table a little bit more like, say, Excel. And instead of having a table that updates a separate component, we could also have the table update itself. So in this example, it's super simple. I've got one column here that's like my input data. And then this second column here is actually computed live. And it's computed through a Python function. This example is really simple. Like all I'm doing here is I'm taking a number and then I'm squaring it. You can see as I'm typing through here, this column on the right gets updated. It gets updated live as I'm typing. And what's hap actually happening here is as I'm typing, this data gets passed back to the Python callback. And inside our callback here, we're just doing a simple computation. So we're pulling in the data, and then we're converting it to a number just in case somebody supplied a string, and then we're squaring it. But you know, again, this, this computation could be arbitrarily complex. So your, your Dash applications, they can have tables that update other components, or the tables could update themselves. So just to step back for a second, what I think is really cool about this table is like um, the spreadsheet interface is really familiar for people. Like we've been, Excel is kind of the first computing platform that most people in the world learn. Um, and, and, it's, and it's really become um, a ubiquitous way to share, uh, to share modeling, to share data, and to share computations. Um, but of course, like we all know that there's many limitations to Excel, like um, the programming language in Excel is, is pretty simple. It's, there's no, um, uh, we don't get the modern software tools like Git um, or code review or tests. Um, and in even the output presentation of Excel is really simple. It's just a spreadsheet with some graphs um, that are laid on top of it. It doesn't always um, it's not as, as rich or even as flexible as something like Dash. Um, but, the, but it's really easy to use, especially for end users. So we work with many companies that 
have these really complex Excel spreadsheets that are like powering the business. Like they are either they're doing financial modeling um, for the business or portfolio optimization, or they're, they're monitoring like entire factories, which is kind of crazy. Um, but, um, but it kind of makes sense because it's such an easy to use platform. Now I think with Dash and with the, with the, especially with this Dash table, we have now these easy to use components that especially for end users are really familiar. Like this type of interface, this spreadsheet interface is really familiar for people. People know how to navigate through these. They understand that these cells are editable. And now with these building blocks, I think we can um, make much more complex applications um, much faster um, that have much more impressive output forms. Um, so entire web applications with multiple graphs or multiple pages, and it can all be powered directly from Python. Um, so this is just kind of one area that I'm really excited about with the table is that like this interface is very ubiquitous and now we're tying it into the web through Dash web applications and we're tying it directly into Python and the whole power of the Python computational ecosystem um, through these Dash callbacks. So that's just taking a little step back, but one of the reasons why we're, why we're investing really heavily inside this table component um, is I think it's, it, it's uh, Dash now has the, has the power to, to um, replace many of these very complex um, Excel spreadsheet driven applications that are powering many businesses in, in a large part of science. Um, so just you know, keep that in, in the back of your mind as you're, um, as you're looking through these examples. Um, so we just got a question, does the callback wait until enter is pressed? So it does. So as I'm typing here, the callback isn't getting fired. It's only until I press enter or only until I arrow down. So there's several different uh, user interfaces that will trigger a callback, either pressing enter or clicking um, or, or arrowing up and down inside these cells. So in these last two examples, we we're thinking of Excel or as this, uh, we're thinking of this spreadsheet component just as a pure user interface component, like just as a way to display many parameters and make those parameters editable. Um, but the table is also a powerful component just for doing, um, for doing uh, data exploration. So in this example, the table isn't editable, but it has these filtering and sorting capabilities um, that are really useful for data exploration. So in this case, I have a table component. It is displaying um, uh, my, my CSV. There's about maybe 2,000 rows inside here. Um, I can page through the different data. Um, and this graph below is just displaying the data table, just displaying the data that's in it. So different columns here. So um, this graph here shows population by country. This graph here shows life expectancy by country. This graph here shows GDP per country. And so with the table, this graph is, is directly tied to this table. So I can do things like filtering in here. Um, so if I wanna look at all countries that have life expectancy that's greater than 60. I can do that. Um, that'll filter the data in here. And once the, once the data is filtered inside here, it'll update these graphs below. Because these graphs depend on the, the, row, the visible rows inside this table. So as these visible rows are updating, either through, um, through filtering um, or through sorting, the callback is getting fired and that's updating these graphs. So in this case, you can think of the table purely more as an exploration tool, um, as a way to um, kind of represent a data set and then be the source of that data set for other um, components on the page like graphs here. So there's some cool features in here with sorting, like I can first sort by continent. So this will group different rows by country, by continent. And then within each country, I can sort by population. And then you can, you can see here how it goes up 
and then we get to the next continent and then the population goes up again and then we get to the next continent population goes up go to the next continent um, and so this is kind of multi-level sorting that's available in the table just by default um, so this sorting and this filtering that's in the table this is happening entirely client side um, which means that as I click on these buttons um, I don't have to implement the sorting myself. The dash table handles it itself and it does it in the web browser. One of the challenges with this is that if you have data that is has maybe millions or billions of rows, you don't want to transfer transport all of that data up to the front end. You just simply because it's too large. It might be like megabytes or gigabytes of data. Um, and just to upload that data up to the web browser would take too long. So one of the really cool features about the data table is that we can do all this filtering and sorting entirely through Python. So that means that when I click on those sorting columns or when I, when I, when I do that filtering, those sorting and filtering settings will get passed into my callback. And then I can use those settings to do filtering or sorting in my Python code. So that might be just in memory in Python, like with pandas, or I might be constructing a SQL query out of those settings um, and then doing the sorting or filtering in SQL and then returning that data back up to Dash. So this chapter here works through several examples. This chapter's um, called, is that the URL slash data table slash callbacks? And I'll just scroll down, this, this chapter builds up with the examples, but I'll scroll down to the end where everything is put together. So with this example here, I'm only transporting five rows up to the web browser. So as I click on this next button, uh, my Python callback is getting fired and that data is getting returned up to the table and the next five rows are returned. So this data set you know, could be in like, let's imagine that this data set actually has 5 billion rows. Um, the data table is really easy. It, 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 this application is really um, performant because we're only uh, visualizing five rows at a time. We're not sending all of that data up to the front end and then trying to page through that. So as I click here, this is, um, it's paging through our really large data set through our Python callback. If I sort inside here, we're passing the sorting data down to the Python callback, um, which is then doing the sorting in pandas and then returning five rows back. And similarly, if I were to filter. So if we look at the code here, it's pretty, it's pretty short, like for doing that amount of what sounds like really um, complex behavior where First, just displaying the table. And then our callback has the paging settings, the sorting settings, and the filtering settings as inputs. And so each of these parameters will update as I click on the different um, UI elements in the table. So as I click on that next button, this pagination properties is going to update, and it's going to update to say page two or page three, depending on how many times that I've clicked on the page button. Similarly with sorting, as I click on that sorting arrow in the columns, um, the, some data is going to get passed into my callback that's going to say which column I click to sort on and, and in which direction. And similarly, if I type in those filtering settings. So this gets all passed into my Python callback. And in here, I implement simple uh, different types of filtering depending on what I typed. So um, and then depending on what I sorted, uh, which columns I sorted by, I'm just using pandas sort values functions to sort the rows depending on my sorting settings. And then I'm uh, paging the data, so I'm only setting, um, uh, getting five rows back at a time um, based off of uh, what I've filtered and sorted. Uh, and then I'm returning that data back up to the front end. And so this is done in, in pandas, like this is a generic recipe that you can use if you have a lot of data that you want to um, uh, page and sort and filter through the back end. But you can also adapt this, this example towards um, any other back end data set that you might have 
um, whether that's uh, that's not in say directly in memory in pandas if that's a SQL backend or an Elasticsearch backend. Um, so that's some really cool behavior. Um, the first part of this webinar, we went, we basically went over part five, editable tables, um, and then the the last two sections we didn't really go over is how to style and size the table, um, but the documentation on on these sections is really good. Um, just briefly, this table you can have you have full control over the way it looks and feels, whether you are rendering it kind of like a spreadsheet with these different cells or whether you're rendering the data more like these rows or whether you want to change the look and feel of the headers or the alignment of the columns um, or even if you want to highlight different data in the table like this um, depending on the values. So this type of conditional formatting that we've come to um, that's you know standard in spreadsheet type applications is is behavior that we're, we're incorporating into the data table itself. So that's, um, that's a really quick high-level overview of the table. Uh, all of this work is on GitHub, so um, you can check out our dash table. You can check out our progress there. Um, we do a lot of, we do most of our um, work entirely in the open, including our, our discussions and our improvements, so you can follow along here. Um, and you can also check out the, um, the change log inside this repository to see which new features are coming out. So just a few days ago, um, a fix was implemented, and, and you can follow along here to see, uh, see what we're working on. But this is an area that we're, um, a project that we're investing a lot of resources in. So we're really excited about it, and um, definitely stay tuned to see all the new behavior. Um, so we've got another question about does the data input to the data table is it able to be written back to the original data source? And it definitely is because um, that data that, that gets changed, um, you can listen to that data in your callbacks and you can do anything that you want with it. So Dash itself doesn't handle writing back to, a, say, a SQL database where it might be or a CSV. But inside your Python callbacks, you can do anything that you want inside here. You have the data, you have the, the raw data and the data that was edited. And inside here, you can do things like write the data to a file, write it back to a SQL, you have full control. Um, so there was another question about the API and for filtering and sorting and whether there's a, a library that we use to make this simpler. There isn't right now because we're still kind of working through the, the interface. So um, this is something that I expect will be changing in the next couple of months. Um, let me find the, the issue here. So there's this issue called V2 filtering settings um, about what does this, this filtering syntax look like. Um, and once we, once we nail this down, I think we will, um, we will try to, uh, um, codify the, 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 syn the new filtering syntax into a Python library um, so that you can do that filtering really easily um, with something like pandas. Now, this is, it's a little bit of a, a tricky area because um, you may want to um, do the filtering in with other libraries like with SQL or Elasticsearch or uh, a database. And I'm not sure if, if we want this library to handle um, translating the filtering and sorting settings to all of the different types of backends. But I imagine that we will at least handle the, um, some common things like translating the filtering and sorting settings into um, uh, pandas compatible calls. Um, there's another question about can you uh, paste multiple cells at the same time from the clipboard? You can. Um, so we we worked hard to make this table um, compatible with, um, with Excel. So um, if you have data that you've copied from Excel, you can copy and paste it into the table as long as the table is editable. And similarly, vice versa, you can select multiple cells, copy from here, and then paste it into an Excel spreadsheet. So those two um, flows work. 
Um, any other uh, any other questions? We're about we're about out of time, but I've got a few more minutes. And if you have any more questions or you're, you're digging in and you can't find something in the documentation, definitely check out the community forum. Um, this, this forum is extremely active um, and folks from the Dash team here in Montreal at our Poly headquarters are in here. I'm in here um, at least once a day helping folks out. So um, definitely check out the forum if you've got any, uh, any questions. Um, there's a question about um, pivot table type functionality. Um, I can imagine that we'll get there eventually, but probably not in the first six months or so. Um, to start, we'll, we'll be doing kind of purely tabular data without much um, shared shared rows that, that you might need if you were doing um, like the type of grouping um, that, that is common in pivot tables. Um, but uh, but we'll see we'll see where we we'll see where we land. We've got a lot more features to work on first. Um, there's another question about can you download data from the table? Um, there is a couple of recipes. Um, I don't have the example up now. Maybe it's so. There's some recipes. These are actually these recipes are on the um, are on the community forum. Oh, this example is not running. There's some recipes in the community forum. Um, for downloading data. Um, that's in this particular form um, that show you how you can wire your callbacks um, into different inputs and outputs so that you can actually have, um, I think here's an example here, you can um, filter your data and then you can have a separate uh, download link or download button um, that would um, contain the filtered, the filtered data. We're also thinking about incorporating this type of download button um, directly into the table itself so that you don't have to wire in that behavior yourself through a separate callback. Um, so there's another question about handling selected rows. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, let me open up an example here. So um, row selections, similar to um, sorting and filtering, is also something that is a property of the table and that you can listen to. So in this particular example, I have um, row selectable is equal to multi. And by setting this to multi, it will display these checkboxes next to every row. And then there's this selected rows property, and this will contain which rows have been selected. So in this particular example, I can click on these different cells, these different rows here, and the, um, the indices of which rows I've selected are passed back to my callback. So if we look at my callback here, I'm listening to um, the selected rows property, and I can do anything that I want with the selected rows. In this particular example, um, I'm taking these selected rows and I'm highlighting the chart below. So it has this lighter blue if I've selected one of the rows. So if I select a few more, this data gets passed back to my graph. And you can see these rows um, uh, get, um, get selected here. So um, that, that data is, is available. Um, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, so right now, this is just uh, selections on per row. Select all isn't available yet, but um, but it, that doesn't mean that it, it won't be. Uh, we will we'll probably add a select all in the future too. Um, just looking at the questions that are coming in. So um, can we adjust the data displayed? So um, say from a lasso on a map, and you definitely could. So in, in most of these examples that we're looking at, um, it's like one-way data flow, like from the table to the graph. But um, it can be two-way as well, where you click on elements inside this graph, and that could update the table itself. So I can listen to properties like selected rows, 
but I can also um, update the data property of the underlying table from a different control. So I could update the data property of the table from selecting a dropdown or from lassoing points in the map. Um, so the data table is kind of read and write. You can, you can read properties that are interactive. You can also write to any, um, any of these properties in the table itself. Like it's totally, um, total programmatic control. Um, and looking at another question. Uh, when sorting, there's going to be another arrow added to the header. Would the arrow width be considered part of the table width or the header width if you set the min width to be zero? Um, I'm actually I'm actually not sure. Um, I'd have to I'd have to dig in um, for the for the arrow width property. I think we're we're positioning it absolutely, but um, but I'm not sure. Um, but most of the stuff about what we know about how sizing and what we can recommend for sizing is in this is in this first chapter. Um, and in this chapter is super comprehensive. It has a lot of really great features um, like multi uh, multi line cells, really flexible um, widths of the of the column headers, whether you're setting those to fixed widths with pixels or flexible widths to percentages, um, or whether you're um, restricting the amount of uh, text that you're showing and then you're you're displaying an ellipses. But lots of different examples in this first chapter and I'll start there um, when you have questions related to, to sizing. Um, so that's that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you so much for attending from all over all around the world. This was really really awesome for me and um, indefinitely um, if you have any questions or you want to share some applications that you're creating, drop them in the community forum and uh, and many of us um, in this call will be there and many of us at Plotly will we'll check it out. Um, so thanks again and uh, and have a wonderful rest of your week.